Hello students, we have seen a series of window dissection on upper limb. Now we will revise the upper limb as a whole. Hello students, in this session we are going to revise the ulnar nerve as a whole. Before we revise, I want you to orient yourself to the specimen. This is the right upper limb and here is the front and this is the lateral aspect. Here is the medial aspect. Now, this is the pectoralis major muscle. We will reflect the major laterally. This small muscle is the pectoralis minor. We will reflect that also laterally. And what you see is the contents of the axilla, the contents of the brachial plexus and its branches, and the axillary vessels. Now we will see the origin, course and termination plus some of the important relations of the ulnar nerve. Here is the ulnar nerve. This is the ulnar nerve. Now this ulnar nerve arises from the medial cord of the brachial plexus. This is the medial cord of the brachial plexus and we have seen the median nerve formed by the medial root and lateral root and this one is a ulnar nerve. It is the terminal big branch of the medial cord of the brachial plexus. Now this nerve, it lies medial to the third part of the axillary artery. In fact, it is between the axillary artery and axillary vein. And then it descends down, down, lying medial to the brachial artery. And almost in the middle of the arm, it pierces the medial intramuscular septum and come to lie in the posterior compartment. If we trace it further, it descends down and runs towards the back of the medial epicondyle. It lies in a groove. The groove is converted into a tunnel by the thickening of the, the fascia over here and the tunnel is known as the cubital tunnel. And the nerve runs, enters the forearm by passing between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor carpi ulnaris. The nerve passes deep to it and you can see the nerve deeper to the flexor carpi, flexor carpi ulnaris so it's overlapped by it and almost at the junction of the upper one third with the lower two thirds it is joined by the ulnar artery. The ulnar artery comes and uh, lies lateral to the nerve so the nerve and vessels run together in the same relationship and it is overlapped at the wrist by the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris and here is a pisiform bone and it lies lateral to the pisiform bone and the relationship the nerve is medial the artery is lateral the ulnar artery if you trace it further the nerve passes Superficial, this is the flexor remnants, it's after the, being cut, the flexor retinaculum. It runs superficial to the flexor retinaculum and then just distal to the pisiform bone, it divides into its terminal branches, namely the superficial branch and deep. So you have a superficial and a deep branch, deep branch and superficial. The superficial branch supplies the superficially placed transversely running muscle, the palmaris brevis, and it gives digital branches to the adjacent sides of the ring finger and little finger and also the medial side of the little finger. So it supplies the medial one and a half fingers. And okay, now let's see the other branches of the ulnar nerve. Now, Ulnar nerve, in the axilla, no branches from the ulnar nerve and also no branches from the ulnar nerve in the arm and then here it starts giving branches. You can see it gives branches to 
the flexor carpi, ulnaris, and also the muscle on which it lies. This is the deeply placed flexor digitorum profundus. So it supplies the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus, whereas the lateral half is supplied by the anterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of the median nerve. So here in the forearm, it supplies two muscles, namely the flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus. And about seven centimeter above the wrist region, it gives off a branch known as the dorsal cutaneous branch. Can you see a branch over here? This is the dorsal cutaneous branch. And this nerve, you can trace it here. It passes deep to the flexor carpi ulnaris and comes over here and divides into dorsal digital branches to supply the dorsum of the hand and the medial one and a half fingers through the dorsal cutaneous branch, okay, right? So this is coming from the ulnar nerve. And then it also gives a palmar cutaneous branch above the wrist that supplies the skin over the hypothenar eminence and adjoining part of the mid palm. And so these are the branches of the ulnar nerve in the forearm, muscular branches to these two muscles and the cutaneous branch to the dorsum as well as the palmar cutaneous branch. Now, the terminal branches, we have seen that it divides into two, a superficial and a deep. The superficial supplies the uh, palmaris brevis as well as the medial one and a half fingers, whereas the deep one is actually supplying the muscles of the hypothenar eminence. So these hypothenar muscles are supplied by the deeper branch, okay? And also, it supplies almost most of the intrinsic muscles of the hand, except the muscles of the thenar eminence and the first two lumbricals. So the muscles which are supplied by the deep branch will be the medial two lumbricals, the hypothenar muscles, the adductor pollicis, the introsiae muscle, palmar and dorsal, Introsia. So, since this nerve innervates the intrinsic, most of the intrinsic muscles of the hand, it is for the for the finer movements of the fingers, okay, for playing music and other things. So, this nerve is called the musician nerve, the ulnar nerve. Please remember this this nerve passes here superficial to the flexor retinaculum and it runs in a tunnel over here, uh, the deeper branch especially, that is a Guyens canal. It is deep to the pisohamid ligament, pisohamid uh, tunnel. With this, we come to the end of discussion on the ulnar nerve. Thank you. Having learnt the normal anatomy of ulnar nerve and its distribution, now let us learn a little about its applied aspects. So first let us learn how to test for ulnar nerve. So I hope all of you know the muscles innervated by ulnar nerve and the cutaneous distribution of the nerve. So to test whether ulnar nerve is intact, we have some named tests. So first test is called as the card test. So here, a stiff card is placed between two adjacent fingers, between the index and middle finger, middle and ring finger, ring and little finger. You can place the card anywhere in between and we have to ask the person to hold the card tightly between the two adjacent fingers and the examiner pulls the card, assessing the strength with which the patient is able to hold the card between the fingers. So here we are actually testing the strength of adduction of fingers. That is, adduction of the fingers is done by palmar introsiae, which is supplied by the deep branch of ulnar nerve. Another test is asking the patient to fan out his fingers, stretch out or fan out his fingers against resistance by the examiner. Here we are actually testing the abduction capacity of the fingers, which is done by dorsal introsiae, which is also supplied by the deep branch of ulnar nerve. Another test here, this test is called as book test. 
where a thick object like a book is placed between the thumb and the index finger and the patient is asked to hold it tightly between the adjacent sides of the thumb and index finger and the examiner exerts attraction onto the book from this side. This test for the adduction capacity of the thumb that is done by adductor pollicis which is also supplied by the deep branch of ulnar nerve. So having understood how to test for the ulnar nerve, let us now see ulnar nerve injury. So ulnar nerve injury can happen most commonly behind the medial epicondyle or in the region of the wrist which is called as the Guyon's canal. These are two sites where ulnar nerve lies superficially and can be injured very easily. What are the signs of ulnar nerve injury? So the first sign of ulnar nerve injury is called as an ulnar claw hand. Claw hand means hyperextension at the metacarpophalangeal joint and flexion at the interphalangeal joints. So Claw hand involving the ring and little fingers is seen in ulnar nerve injury and is known as ulnar claw hand. If all the four fingers have to be involved, then it is called as a complete claw hand which happens when there is a combined lesion of median nerve as well as ulnar nerve. So claw hand happens because of paralysis of lumbricals. And we all know that lumbricals produce flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joints and extension at the interphalangeal joint. So when they paralyze, the opposite action arises that is called as a claw hand. So this also becomes marked because of the hyperaction of the extensors at the metacarpophalangeal joint as well as the flexor digitorum profundus tendon. Now at this juncture, let us know what is ulnar paradox. The meaning of the word ulnar paradox is that the severity of the claw hand is more marked when the ulnar nerve injures distally than when it is injured proximally. That is, if ulnar nerve is injured at the Guyon's canal, claw hand will be more prominent. Whereas if it is injured at the medial epicondyle, claw hand will be less prominent. So this is against what we expect. Usually we expect that higher the injury, more fibers of the nerve are affected, more marked should be the symptoms. The reason for ulnar paradox is that, as I already said, claw hand is more marked also because of the action of the flexor digitorum profundus tendon. So, when the injury to ulnar nerve happens at the level of medial epicondyle, the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus also paralyzes, resulting in less flexion at the interphalangeal joints. So, there will be only hyperextension at the metacarpophalangeal joint. So, the appearance of claw, clawing will be lesser. So that is called as ulnar paradox. Next is Froman sign. So here you can just recollect the book test that I had explained. So this is the normal functioning adductor pollicis where the patient is able to hold the book correctly between the adjacent sides of thumb and index finger. But if the adductor pollicis of one side is paralyzed, we can see that when the examiner tries to pull the book, patient tries to still hold the book but not by adduction of the thumb but by flexion of the thumb. So here flexor pollicis longus is acting because adductor pollicis is paralyzed. This is the abnormal adductor pollicis or this is where the ulnar nerve is injured. This sign is called as froment sign. Next is loss of Cutaneous innervation of the area supplied by the ulnar nerve. There will be loss of sensation of the medial one and a half fingers both on the palmar side as well as on the dorsal side because of effect on palmar cutaneous and dorsal cutaneous branches of ulnar nerve. So that's all about the clinical anatomy of ulnar nerve. Thank you.